Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining this session. My name is Alberto Romero. I'm CTO at Human. Um, my background is mainly in um, data analytics and big data, uh, which I've done for, for a number of years now, um, mainly in the financial services sector. Um, around three years ago, I co-founded, along with three other people, Human, um, which um, started as a data-first company, so all all four of the co-founders have a um, background in data analytics and, and big data. Um, so what we the way we define ourselves is um, as a deep tech um, insure tech company that operates mainly in the commercial fleet industry. And our customers are um, commercial fleets of vehicles that typically, but not exclusively, um, work in the right hill space um, through companies like Uber. And so to dive into what it is that we do at Human, um, I'll start by uh, describing the main issue commercial fleets of vehicles uh, face with insurance. So in the traditional insurance landscape, underwriters price insurance by, first of all, assuming past facts will still apply in the future. And secondly, they would just cater for fleet parameters um, that are very basic and they would not cater at all by who is actually driving the vehicles. So what we see is three main flaws in the traditional insurance model, um, which are around risk pricing, which is all entirely based on averages and history, um, and also the, the seven factors in, in the case of the consumer market. Um, the seven factors are essentially those questions you, you get asked when you try to get insurance um, around um, what your uh, age is, uh, what your gender, what you do for a living, what you park your vehicle overnight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the second point is around risk management. Um, uh, in traditional insurance um, operate blindly when it comes to risk. Um, because they just ask those questions at the beginning and that's it. Um, they don't have any further information about how the assets are actually being used um, and what their exposure to risk is, is actually, um, in, in fact, in the, in the real world. Um, and then in terms of uh, risk mitigation, there's um, pretty much nothing around um, any tooling that they, they provide um, to, the, to the customers, to the consumers, or in this case, to, to fleet owners to understand what their risks are um, and how they can manage those risks um, and uh, potentially try to bring them down and, and hence uh, try to also bring down their, their, um, their premiums. Right. Um, so some people might, might argue that uh, this is actually already resolved through the addition of telematic devices to vehicles um, that sometimes gets advised by insurance companies. But the truth is that actual insurance pricing is completely disconnected from any driver scoring that those devices may produce. Uh, that driver scoring that um, from those devices is actually very basic. Um, they all, all, all they do is scoring um, individual events um, in total isolation with no context, no correlation between each other. Um, it's just uh, pure um, individual event scoring. Um, and then fleet, manage fleet managers um, still find their themselves um, trying to um, use very basic metrics, um, such as, for example, mileage or fuel consumption to aim at trying to get a cheaper premium. So they end up uh, reducing their mileage or, or reducing consumption of fuel, et cetera. So that's how they can bring costs down. Um, so we essentially what we've built is a real-time dynamic risk platform for insurance. Um, the platform uses streaming analytics to process both telematics and contextual data at high frequency. Um, what I mean by telematics data and what I've been, um, I guess, uh, talking about um, before uh, is essentially things like GPS data, such as location or speed. Uh, there's also telemetry from the vehicle, for example, odometer and uh, fuel consumption. Um, there's also accelerometer data that uh, we use to detect events that can be associated to, um, say, for example, aggressive um, uh, behavior when driving. And then in terms of contextual data, um, includes the likes of uh, weather conditions, 
uh, road traffic models we've built um, that defined how uh, risky roads are, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what our platform provides is informed decision making based on all this aggregated data. And models continuously get improved through the data that we just naturally consume and validate. Right, so um, just moving on to the um, uh, te technical stack and, and uh, the very high level, um, we, we have uh, essentially three different products. Um, so on the right, you see RadShare, um, which is our risk management web application for fleets that um, surfaces the relevant insights uh, from the analytics data that will drive and measure um, better decision making for, for those fleet owners. Um, and then on the left, you see Risk OS, which is es essentially where all that processing happen, uh, happens and is completely um, hidden from the customer. It essentially is able to uh, measure risk exposure of a given asset in a specific geolocation at any given time. Um, we do that by taking several data inputs, um, as described earlier. So um, that can be telematics data, um, road, um, weather, driver uh, profiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have telematics and contextual data um, that then produce uh, a combined output um, of uh, precise risk calculation. Um, we have a third product called CityPools, but I'll talk about it uh, a little bit later. So back to the technical platform. Um, we run everything in AWS, um, and most of our services and jobs and um, components run on Kubernetes. Our streaming analytics pipeline, as you probably guessed, uh, uses Flink, um, and then we use Kafka as a um, messaging framework. Um, our platform is entirely designed as an event-driven um, architecture, meaning that everything that happens in our platform is um, an event and is stored um, at every single point of transformation. Um, we store every everything we ingest and we store every transformation um, step in the process um, onto S3 um, as events. And that allows us several things. Um, allows us to replay those events later on um, if needed. Uh, we use that for testing purposes. We use that um, also for um, uh, potentially uh, troubleshooting. Um, and also we, we use that to trace um, results. So when our platform produces specific results, we can um, trace back uh, how it was produced and what were the circumstances under um, uh, under which it they were produced um, and so on. So we can explain our results and potentially make um, uh, also further improvements to some of the components, replay the events, and then um, just validate the data at the other end. Um, in terms of storage, I already mentioned S3 uh, very briefly, which is what we use for um, uh, storage of every single um, step through the pipeline uh, in terms of transformation. But then we also use Elasticsearch mainly as a uh, um, storage mechanism and an indexing mechanism for our events um, in the real-time platform. Um, and we also use a little bit of DynamoDB as well. Um, on top of those, we have uh, GraphQL, which um, is a framework that basically fuses everything together and allows us to make all the data very, very queryable um, from uh, multiple components, not just the, the, the web front end, uh, which is Rapture, but also from various other sources. So um, uh, GraphQL really, um, uh, you know, is spread through uh, the whole platform and allows us to um, make it, um, as I said, very queryable and, um, uh, and and very flexible as well. Um, and then we also use uh, Apache Kylin and that some of some of you um, might be familiar with. So Kylin we use for a couple of different things, a couple of different use cases. One of them is um, for real time uh, analytics. So we we use um, uh, direct. Kafka ingestion um, cubing, all up cubing through Kylin, which allows us to do uh, lots of aggregations on the fly and produce some insights on the fly 
um, to provide the customer with. And then secondly, we also use it as a, as a uh, batch post-processing analytics framework. Um, so after we've produced all these, um, all these aggregations, all this data, um, we can actually uh, produce even further insights um, by uh, combining lots and lots of different data sets, result sets we, we produce, and uh, again, expose or surface those insights or results to the, to the customer. Um, right, so moving on to, um, our, I guess, the, the, the actual design and the high-level uh, platform architecture. Um, so this is a very simplified um, schema of what uh, we have implemented. Um, it's, I say it's very simplified because it's, it's really summarizing almost at subsystem level um, what steps we, we are actually um, taking uh, through the whole pipeline and um, in terms of uh, transforming data, ingesting data first, then transforming it and then producing our, our insights and our um, aggregated results. Um, so first of all, on the left, you can see a representation of a fleet. Um, we obviously ingest a lot of data uh, from fleets, typically at um, 10 to 100 hertz, uh, which means um, 10 to 100 points per second um, in terms of accelerometer data, then GPS data at one um, hertz, uh, so GPS points every second. And um, we, when we ingest all that data, um, we have, um, uh, first of all, a mapping phase, um, which is how we map um, data that comes from external um, sources, such as uh, telematics providers, into our own schemas. Um, and we do normalization, uh, standardization, you know, all the, all the usual data engineering side of things. Um, and then on, uh, at the top, you can see drivers and lease events coming into the data ingestion pipeline as well. Um, so when drivers do share their information, we do ingest it, um, and we are able to then join uh, events that come from the vehicles with the drivers that are driving those vehicles, and that's what allows us to do driver profiling um, over time. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't operate when we don't know who the driver is, and that's um, you know prime example maybe um, um, uh, a delivery company where you know there's a fleet of vehicles available for for people to take, say, um, on a daily basis, and um, uh, people who are doing deliveries um, they just take um, the first vehicle they, the, there is available, and, and that's it. So um, it's very dynamic. Um, you can't really tell uh, unless you put some some further. Um, hardware and infrastructure in, in place, um, who is actually driving every single time. But um, we still cater for that use case as well. Um, in, in that particular case, we just um, assign all the events and all the contextual data to the vehicle itself. And we still, we still do all the processing and, and so on. It's just the driver profiling um, in, in that case is, um, is not available. Um, so after the mapping phase, we have uh, a couple of things happening. First of all, at the top is the vehicle state subsystem, which essentially is in charge of um, maintaining uh, a real-time view of the vehicles um, in memory. Um, and then the second one at the bottom is the event detection. So with event detection, we typically take uh, both GPS and accelerometer data, um, and we use those to um, detect events such as speeding, uh, harsh braking, harsh acceleration or cornering, um, um, near crash detection, actual crash detection, and so on. Uh, then further down we have trip detection. Um, trips are a very important concept for us because trips are basically um, an en entities that allow us to um, uh, uh, be able to allocate uh, specific events and uh, a context to something that was happening at uh, a given time. And it's got a beginning and it's got an end. Um, so for us uh, at the moment, um, trips are, are quite key because the scoring we do and the, um, uh, the pricing we do is at trip level. Um, so all the context gets put into, in, in place um, in, the, in the trip and through the trip, and that's what get price, gets priced, and um, it's basically um, almost like usage-based, 
um, insurance, plus all the contextual analysis, all the um, event detection, again, contextualized and enriched and, and so on. Um, further down, we have a fatigue detection um, part, uh, which also runs on Flink. All the, obviously all the uh, squirrels are Flink jobs uh, or Flink-based uh, sub subsystems. The fatigue detection, in a sense, takes um, circadian rhythms, uh, for those of you in the know, um, that basically allows us to determine how fatigued a driver is, not just by um, being uh, or having been driving for, for a number of hours in a row, but also just detecting patterns over time. So that same driver may have been driving for uh, several days in a row and um, with a specific um, pattern and, you know, that builds up to, to fatigue. Um, and that's the sort of thing we, we care for. Um, so that's an important factor for us as well in terms of scoring. Um, and then there are other other bits and pieces on the um, on the pipeline, which are uh, mainly written in Go. Um, there are things such as trip enrichment, which is after the trip have, uh, has completed, we and en we enrich it with additional information about what was going on uh, at that time in that location. Was the the start and end points for in terms of um, postcodes um, and things like that. Um, then we we score it, uh, which is our um, our scoring algorithm where, where it comes into play. Uh, we score the trip based on those events that we detected, and we enriched with the context and all of that. We produce uh, what we call insurance transactions. So insurance transactions are entities that essentially map trips to uh, an insurance um, product um, per se. So when we have a an insurance uh, product in particular associated to a trip or or to a group of cars in a trip in a trip in a in a fleet, sorry, um, then though um, the insurance transaction service will just um, price call the pricing engine and um, based on the the score uh, produced during the trip and all the contextual data from the trip, it just um, produces a a price and a produces almost like a transaction. Um, so it's a tra purely transactional system of the um, of the trips and um, the, the the premiums that are required to be paid um, completely dynamically. Um, so as you would expect for a um, pay as well a, a usage based um, insurance product. Right. Um, what I'd like to do next is before moving on to how we use Flink to process all the telematics data in real time, um, I wanted to show you uh, a few examples of the sort of scenarios um, that we do in terms of contextual um, data. The third product I mentioned earlier, um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, a, little, a little later, um, was CityPulse. Um, and it's what I wanted to um, essentially briefly explain now. So CityPulse is uh, our geolocation uh, risk analysis platform. Um, it basically is able to take lots of um, contextual information from um, uh, elements such as uh, the weather, the roads, um, uh, the road features, um, uh, historical accidents data, um, uh, things like that, and then combines all that together and um, along with uh, machine learning models we produce, we can actually infer um, risk based on all those factors. So uh, just to give you a, a few examples on that, um, on the left you see a map of London and a representation of risk on different road segments uh, based on, as I said, things like traffic and other parameters such as road features, uh, time of the day, etc. And it also shows how trips intersect with uh, areas of varying risk, which is what you see right there, right now. Um, those uh, red colored um, uh, road segments um, are essentially uh, representing the intersection of areas with very um, with varying risks and um, so this is what we refer to as uh, risk POIs and geospatial risk so I'll elaborate uh, a little more about this on the next slide with another example actually uh, but 
um, before then, on the right, uh, you see uh, just a slightly different example, um, which is a heat map of the UK. Um, and it's actually mapping out um, weather conditions as they change throughout the country, um, where darker colors um, represent higher risk. Um, so again, that's um, just a visual representation of what our models do in terms of ascertaining what the risk is based on, in this case, weather conditions. Um, right, on this um, other example, and going back to geospatial risk, um, we, work through, we work with many different um, data sets from different sources, and, and one of them actually includes the accident data from police records. Um, so what we do is we look at features of the road, uh, such as traffic lights, uh, stop signs, um, shops in the area, uh, the actual geometry of the road, um, even bus stops and post boxes. And from all those features of the, of the area, we, we can make a prediction of accident risk um, given those conditions. Now the way, the way this is clearly um, represented and in this example is, um, we can actually go to an unseen urban area, which is um, what you see here. And um, our models will be able to predict flag spots, um, which are represented by those red dots and um, uh, yellow and orange areas on the map. Um, and basically comparing what our models predict with the ground truth um, are actually not very different. Um, some of those red spots are um, slightly slightly off, but again, not 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 too much. And it's a it's an accurate uh, enough uh, way of ascertaining risk in parts of the world where um, we where we can't really re have data or retrieve data from to to make the, the the risk analysis. Obviously, the more data we have about about roads. Um, the the merrier because then we can um, actually ascertain what the what the real risk is, um, but um, failing that our models um, can be applied to um, other parts of the world where we've never been and um, equally just understand um, what their actual risk is by just by looking into the the road features the um, the road segments the geometry and all of that and what's um, around those areas. Um, moving on to the, uh, the next example, um, this is around near crash detection. Um, so with near crash detection, um, on the right, you see a, some footage on, uh, from a car that is just about to hit something that is um, coming into the road. Um, it might take a couple of times for you to actually see it, but I'll tell you it's happening right there. Right? So you see, once again, right there. Um, there's a small maneuver from the vehicle just um, trying to avoid that object. Um, and basically, um, just to explain uh, what, what's happening on the left, is basically we, we call in our, our um, uh, model. And we're not really using um, the footage itself. We don't really use video for, um, uh, for this prediction. We actually use accelerometer data. So just by... Um, reading the accelerometer data and um, calculating um, variations in the in the accelerometer vectors, we can determine, in fact, if um, someone just tried to avoid hitting um, an object on the road, for example, like it happens in this case. Um, so this is um, just representing um, and showing how um, our model works and, and is able to detect um, a near crash detection. Um, this example is uh, perhaps a little clearer. So you see the car on the front. Um, they is running on the on the uh, lane on the right. Now is changing lanes. Yeah, there. So almost hits the the vehicle um, where this recording is coming from. But the vehicle just manages to to avoid it. So again, um, is detecting a near crash. What you see, uh, I'll see it again. So now the vehicle on the right is just changing lanes and yeah, our vehicle has to basically maneuver to avoid that collision. Um, so what you see on the left is um, in essence the, um, a, a table that represents um, the, po the potential 
predictions from the model. So you have a baseline where nothing's really happening. You have a near crash, which um, was detected uh, at a 80.84.6 percent, um, and then a crash which was detected at 15.4 percent. So there is um, there is a, a sufficient um, uh, level of accuracy here to um, detect this event as a near crash, and it's actually what 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 did happen. Right, so um, that was the, the last example I had um, for you from from uh, city pools perspective and what we do from a contextual analysis perspective. So I just wanted to quickly move on to um, our journey with, Flinks, with Flink and uh, what our challenges have been. So I start by saying that we've not always used Flink. Um, in fact, we used to uh, use Spark, uh, Spark streaming on our um, previous version of the platform uh, around a couple of years. A couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago or so, um, we we found a number of limitations at the time. Uh, again, I won't I won't comment on whether those limitations would have been solved now um, on Spark, but um, the truth is that we were usually finding ourselves um, trying to work around those issues, um, and it wasn't it wasn't practical for us to do so. So it, it wouldn't allow us, allow us to do um, things with um, uh, you know watermarks and um, other elements of real-time processing that um, are native to Flink um, are, aren't quite for, for Spark. Um, but what I wanted to mention um, here was just a few challenges that we've been um, uh, we've faced uh, in the past uh, with Flink. And I'll start um, with job management. So we started using EMR. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are AWS users. Um, but we found it difficult to monitor jobs um, as well as to define job deployments as code. Uh, one remark I need to make at this point is that um, we're very meticulous in terms of defining absolutely everything in our platform as code. Um, our, whole, our whole infrastructure, our whole pipeline, everything is defined as code. It can be deployed essentially in any region, in any areas, any point in time um, automatically. Um, or just by um, following um, a, a little recipe. Um, and that, that is a very powerful um, idea and it's a very powerful um, uh, way to work. And that's um, um, kudos to our DevOps team who have worked really hard to, to achieve that. So um, one of our main interests in um, doing anything in terms of uh, deploying jobs automatically was around um, making those deployments possible through code and it is possible to do that through emr steps so i won't say um that's completely impossible and again this is completely referring to our own experience um but um yeah using emr steps and, and cloud formation uh was sort of complex to manage and uh, wasn't really integrating that well with our entire ci cd pipeline um and in, just in general terms we also found it very difficult to um do certain job management tasks such as restarting jobs or um uh, managing checkpoints for example it was just too hard we would have had to build lots of uh, scripts and and things on top of um what existed to make it workable, and um, we weren't quite prepared to do that. So we wanted to go a little more mainstream with the current times, and we moved to Kubernetes in January this year, and have seen so far the benefits of uh, having a better integrating monitoring uh, by using Prometheus and Grafana. We are being able to deploy job pipelines entirely as code through Kubernetes manifests. Um, we are still uh, working on a further uh, improvement here to uh, make all of our jobs um, uh, deploy deployable through uh, Helm charts. Um, everything else in our in our platform, um, in terms of microservices and so on, is deployable through Helm. Um, it's just the the Flink jobs we still need to do. Um, there are a few challenges there, so we still we still need to work through them. Um, and it's also improved the way we can manage uh, the job cycle. So um, that includes things like restarts or checkpointing um, or state management. Um, moving on to the next um, challenge, uh, which is handling time and event lateness, which is always a challenge, an interesting challenge 
uh, on any real-time analytics platform such as Flink. Um, the first point to make here is um, uh, the concept of timeliness versus correctness. Um, the way I would personally describe it um, is that it's always a tensor-based decision in that um, the more timely you are, the less correct you're going to be. Or in other words, you can be 100% timely and, um, and then not be correct um, at all or um, the other way around. The, the way the way the best way to explain this is with an example so um, if you want to remain uh, completely real time as a platform say a platform like, like ours that provides with insights to customers um, in real time um, the more we do that in real time um, the more the more chances we're going to, to get to um, miss late events for example and sometimes that's all right. Sometimes late events um, can be completely uh, ignored, but in many cases they are they can be very relevant, and we want to be able to wait long enough for those low, uh, late events um, to make them part of the um, uh, of the operators. The second concept is around event time versus processing time, which, which you probably all know about. Uh, event time being the time when the actual event happens, and processing time when it's actually processed. So in an ideal scenario, your event time and process time would be identical. That means no latency. But um, in the real world, uh, latency is actually introduced by defining how long you are prepared to wait um, before an operator gets triggered, which links into what I was talking about earlier on late events. And here's where, where watermarks uh, play a very important um, part, just handling uh, time and flow and flowing as part of the stream uh, while carrying carrying a, a timestamp. So watermarks enable event time to progress by making the operator advance time, as you know, um, and they have a, an impact on out of order events. So for us, um, this means that there is a decision to potentially leave events out of the main real time stream operators and deal with them um, as a side output or as a batch process retrospectively. And so part of this decision is to decide whether um, uh, there is a watermark generation based on a fixed lag behind uh, processing time, or we want to allow for a um, fixed uh, out of orderness, um, which is a separate concept where the latest elements for a certain timestamp um, will arrive at most uh, that fixed time value after the earliest elements um, for that timestamp. Um, and then the last consideration um, here would be that uh, we can also, or it was possible to use allowed lateness, um, which is good if you know what you're doing, um, but it can be a little, a little hard to predict in terms of um, you know what it would actually come out of it, because um, what allowed lateness does is um, allowing events past the watermark, but still within the window, to to be part of that window and. Um, and then in some cases, that means that uh, we do late firings of the window. Um, and it also means that we fire the window multiple times. Um, and that essentially means du duplicates or, or um, exposure to duplicates. So if your pipeline manages duplicates well, then that's not a problem for you. Um, but again, it's something to be um, quite, quite wary about. Uh, the next problem I wanted to discuss was or touch on uh, was idling sources. Um, so I'll explain that a little bit. So as you know, we uh, ingest from uh, different uh, sources of events, um, which are um, which have different or are potentially going to have different event times. So for example, the internal clocks on each of those device vendors um, might have a different specification, a different chipset, or they might not just not be consistent with an absolute time. So in such cases, when handling and consolidating those events downstream, the wat watermarks produced by one of the sources event, event time can actually make some events from the other sources to get dropped because they could actually be marked as late events, if you see what I mean. So that itself is, again, is a bit of a uh, challenge. Uh, you, can f you can work around that by having multiple instances of the jobs uh, one per um, source, um, and that's workable. Is is perhaps not the most cost-effective way of um, uh, you know fixing that, 
but again, it's, it's something that can be done. And then uh, the last one I wanted to touch on is uh, joins with uh, uh, slow chain in streams. So this is an interesting, an interesting one, which um, with uh, in, in the particular case of uh, enriching driving events with vehicle lease events. Um, I mean, that's, that's a very clear example on, on when it would actually happen. So lease events, as a reminder, is basically when a, a driver uh, is leasing a vehicle and, and then there's a change of, of, of drivers um, that basically can happen every, say, six months or a year. So that's a lease event. So it's very, it's a, it's a slow change in stream um, compared to our um, main uh, feed, which is the driving events feed. Um, and that's basically where we get all the GPS or events data from the vehicle. So um, the obvious choice might seem to be um, just using a join operator on a data stream API. Um, that's got a fundamental flow, which is that you are actually joining with every element of the slow changing stream that um, was ever part of that stream. So the join will assign events to every driver that has ever leased the vehicle rather than just the last one, which is the obvious um, outcome we want to get out of this. Um, using the, the table API and uh, joining by using a temporal table um, is a good solution. Um, but if you still want to use the data stream API, another alternative is, for, for example, to uh, perform a broadcast date. Um, so updates on the slow changing stream um, can be propagated down the broadcast um, channel. Um, and then just to finalize on the presentation, I wanted to uh, uh, just say what we, what we are up to now. Um, we've just recently won a, a grant from Innovate UK, which is a government um, grant where we are going to be tackling the um, use case of autonomous vehicles and their insurance. And the interesting um, thing about this is that the uh, autonomous vehicles will have many, many more um, sources of data. And, um, and then there are um, other elements such as cyber risk models that we also need to cater for. Um, so that's uh, going to be a big project for us uh, in, the, in the upcoming year, year and a half or so. So that's what, where we're going to be um, quite busy and um, very excited to, um, to be doing that. Um, and that was it really. Um, I'll, I'll leave it open for uh, Q&A um, if there are any questions, but um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, uh, just being here, as I said earlier, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll welcome any questions. Thank you.